We are known, as the saying goes in the trade craft, we are known by our failures. We don't want to talk about successes because that will give the other chap an idea how they succeeded. We don't want him to know. But it's the Pakistan army which owns the country. So they then use the ISI as... In, ISI is another core in the Pakistan army. Like uh, the military, the fighting corps, they have the intelligence corps whose job it is to control the population at home and to operate abroad. How do you think Osama bin Laden was staying there for so long? I mean, I, I refuse to believe that nobody knew he was there, nobody in authority knew he was there. Then that agency is no good. Friends, on this episode of the Chanakya Dialogues, I bring to you Mr. Vikram Sood, former chief of the research and analysis wing. The former chief of RAW tells us what actually happens on ground. Why is human intelligence important? He will discuss China, he will discuss Pakistan, and of course, he will discuss the very, very important Afghanistan scenario. Like, subscribe, and don't forget to press the bell icon. Welcome to the Chanakya Dialogues. Yeah, thank you very much, Gaurav, for having me on your show. And I look forward to our discussions that follow. Sure. Absolutely. Sir, in today's day and age, you know, people talk about SIGINTS, uh, signal intelligence. Uh, they talk about, uh, uh, you know, various kinds of intelligence from satellites to uh, electronic intelligence, etc. Sir, Somewhere along the way, there has been an argument uh, amongst various people who call themselves experts that the day and age of human intelligence is absolutely gone. There is no need for the man on the ground. I'd like to ask you this, sir. how relevant do you think this argument is? Is human intelligence still relevant in the 21st century? Uh, well, I, I am old school in many ways because yeah. when I started my career, we didn't have any of these technologies that exist today. So we used to work in the traditional fashion, perhaps a little advanced on the World War II style. It was human intelligence, it was human operations for collection, surveillance, everything. Everything was by the, by the human beings. Perhaps only thing that we had different was uh, wireless messaging. Then you had telex as a great advancement. And then we moved on to, you know, as, as technology developed. The 70s were different, 80s were different. And I think Change has come from the 90s in a big way. The internet, the communication revolution, and now the social media. You can do it almost decadal. 90s, the first century, first decade of 20th century, 21st century, and the second. So uh, we are, we are uh, now looking at technology intensive activity. But I still feel you cannot do without the human intelligence, the human factor. Okay, now surveillance is different. It is technological. They can look into everything without your knowing about it. We all know that. You don't have to... The human surveillance of a target is probably not required now. Uh, you, if you've seen movies like uh, uh, series like Homeland and so on and so forth, it's all depicted as technology computer based. But and then we probably move on to artificial intelligence and algorithms as we go along. We don't know what the future is going to be like. Yes, it is going to be more and more technology intensive. So you have you have over overload information overload also. You have billions and billions of messages being downloaded by superpowers. Then they have hundreds and thousands of men and women who put it together. It's not enough to have information on your desk. You've got to analyze it. The algorithm and the computer may take you up to a particular point. But beyond that, how do you assess the intentions of the government that you are targeting or the, the tar your target. How do you assess that? 
you've got to have human expertise you've got to have you know google translate is fine it'll translate your documents but there is something more to it than just a translation there is the nuance there is you know we we had experts who could tell you know that from the signal the way he was using the the code that is 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 a different person is not the same man who who are agent force the signal is different therefore talking to a person and listening to him his his tonality the way he behaves is going to be different your operational methods may change the way you operate and collect intelligence will change maybe but your abilities to analyze and give the final assessment will have to be human for a long time and in any case machines don't automatically keep following people you got to know which one to follow particularly in a country like ours we don't have unlimited technology we don't have unlimited threats either we have specific threats we're not a global superpower that has to have everything into its uh, information box so we got to be specific we got to divide our resources or, or spread our resources uh, within our means which means that the human element will always remain with us we just cannot rely only on technology because we don't know where the technology is going to go and who is controlling that technology also we don't know absolutely sir so, so there there are lots of ifs and buts we just can't rule out human intelligence for for a long long time to come sir not in any way absolutely sir intelligence agencies uh, you know cannot be everywhere 100% of the time and even the united states of america could not uh, predict or prevent 911 sir in spite of the cia having a massive budget running into billions upon billions of dollars some say hundreds of billions of dollars and having stations everywhere satellites etc they could not figure out why is this constant expectation from intelligence agencies you've been the chief of ross uh, why this constant expectation from intelligence agencies that you have to deliver every time intelligence is not an exact art now i am not from the intelligence community but this even i understand sir this even i understand it's logical you can't be omnipresent yeah even america russia nobody can be omnipresent sir but why this expectation that you know 100% on the ball i think i think uh, gorov this is more media generated expectation when we deal with the government at least my impression was they they understand that there are limitations they understand that we can't give everything all the time so like this what is your estimation what is your assessment is what they they look for you if you if you give them exact information who who doesn't like that but if you tell them you haven't got it it may not be possible to get it there is an understanding that this is not possible and and i think also uh, when 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 the when the chips are down or when when things go wrong they it's also easy to blame intelligence because you know the the defense forces are sovereign the country is sovereign you can't say they have failed so you go to have a fall guy we are the fall guys and we take the rap we are known as the saying goes in the trade craft we are known by our failures we don't want to talk about successes because that will give the other chap an idea how they succeeded we don't want him to know Absolutely. that we have so this is a this is something that you take it on your chin and move on absolutely very well said sir we are known by our failures spies are known by their failures sir i read this somewhere i read this comment somewhere also there somebody had quoted you sir and yeah. uh, my my third question is about chinese intelligence sir it's it's now uh, seemingly more pervasive than before china is using its economic muscle to uh, you know like the confucius uh, foundations yeah. everywhere and having these ngos abroad and mm. trying to influence people especially in america especially in europe sir we have seen mm. chinese intelligence 
exploding in, in the field of cyber warfare also, China is coming up in a little bit. My question to you is, uh, uh, has this been building up for a long time? Have the Chinese been at it? Do you think this is a recent phenomenon? Where do you see it going so in your estimation? Let me, let me just give you a little bit of perspective. Um, I'm sure you know that. The Chinese intelligence was born with the Chinese Communist Party. Sure. In Mao's days. And they had, they may not have called it the Ministry of uh, uh, Public Security, but they had, uh, I don't remember what the name was, but they've had it all along. And in 1983, they created the Ministry of uh, Ministry of uh, MSS, uh, Security, Military Security Services, I don't remember. MSS was the external intelligence. So these two have been there for a long time. And it is easy for an intelligence agency to operate in a totally authoritarian surrounding. Because there's no questions asked. And intelligence collection for the Chinese has been a prime objective. A, for internal security. They're paranoid about dissent. They're paranoid about people having different points of view. They're paranoid about, paranoid about possibilities of coups, which have happened in the past or attempts have been made. So they, they, they are geared to this. Security is, uh, is almost a religion for them. So they have grown immensely in the last 10, 15 years particularly. And now with the Xi's ambitions, they have become even more active. Perhaps, uh, I mean, Africa, for instance, they, they, the presence in Africa, the presence for economic reasons, the presence in Pakistan, Afghanistan, perhaps in Iran. Iranians have been complaining, but that's how they've been operating. So uh, they, are, they are now like a superpower in their intelligence activity. All pervasive, pervasive, everywhere, want every bit of information. You know, they use their diaspora, they are like emigrants for intelligence collection by law. The National Security Law of 19, 2017 says it is incumbent upon Chinese to give information to the state. We don't have that. We don't ask our, our expatriate Indians living abroad that you have to do this by law. Yes, sir. So, so the, 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 the difference of operation. No, absolutely, sir. Uh, uh, sir, I'm, I'm going to ask you a question which uh, uh, I had not noted down that I'll ask, but it just seems to me that in India, uh, and this is not something that I expect you to answer, sir, it's just an observation from my side, we simply have too many agencies, sir. And, uh, you know, too many agencies, like America is pretty sorted. It is CIA for external intelligence, it is FBI for internal security and intelligence, and then you have something called the Homeland Security, sir. Now, coming to the question of Pakistan, now my question is that, sir, Pakistan has the inter-services intelligence, which is the mother of all intelligence agencies. They have half a dozen or a dozen intelligence agencies, but you never hear their names. So it's, it's only the ISI. Uh, how does it work? I mean, uh, they, they are the people who, who are busy, uh, you know, staging coups inside Pakistan. They're also doing operations abroad. There is one mothership, one mother agency. How, how does this work? Because I, I'm, I'm uh, drawing this conclusion because you said that in China, spying is relatively easy. Intelligence operations are relatively easy because it's a totalitarian state. And there are no questions asked. Similarly in Pakistan, sir, it is, it is, it is like China light, if I may say. So it, it's, a, it's a diluted it is, version of is. China, but that, that, that is what it is. So how does, it, how, how does the ISI actually do it, sir? Internal, external. It's like, it's, it's like, it's like in China, only they have uh, Namkewas, the democracy. But it's the Pakistan army, which owns the country. So they then use the ISI as... Is, ISI is another core in the Pakistan army. Sure. Like uh, the military, the fighting corps, they have the intelligence corps, whose job it is to control the population at home 
and to operate abroad. They have IB, they have FIA, they have all those agencies floating around. But this is their task, to keep Pakistan secure for themselves. Funds are not a problem. Budget is not a problem. You can, uh, you can access money from other sources. You will call that uh, Aslam Beg and uh, one other general, I think. Um, they had gone to Nawaz Sharif said, we, got, we can use drug money for our intelligence operation. So that's how it works there. You, and and there, is no accounting. There. there is no accounting, there, there is no questions asked. Unto, unto myself, you account to me, but that's it. And I'm accountable to no one. Oh, that is the way so, it works. Sir. And that's the way it works. And how, how do you think Osama bin Laden was staying there for so long? I mean, I, I refuse to believe that nobody knew he was there. Nobody in authority knew he was there. Then that agency is no good. <laughs> Very well said, sir. Uh, Abbottabad kept, you know, it's next door to Abbottabad, he was staying in that huge mansion and fathering kids, and you don't know. So, and wives keep going and up and down. I believe he once traveled to Karachi also. Sir. So, what is it that they didn't know? Absolutely, sir. Absolutely. Uh, Sir, uh, now my last question to you is, sir, uh, about the situation in Afghanistan, sir. You know, uh, Pakistan has tried to influence traditionally because of this strategic depth mindset that, you know, Afghanistan is our backyard and we will continue to try and influence Afghanistan. They've tried the same thing in Kashmir also. How do you see the situation in Afghanistan? Uh, uh, because uh, unfolding, sir, because uh, what I feel is that sir, this Durand line, the Durand line, which the Pashtuns refuse to recognize, whether they're in Pakistan or they're in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And even, even the Taliban, sir, who are essentially Pashtuns, sir, essentially Pashtuns, even the Taliban have been known to damage that fence and walk across into Pakistan. Pakistan made a very fancy fence, which the Taliban keeps on blowing up mm -hmm. every now and then. How do you see the situation in, in Afghanistan unfolding over the next 10 years, sir, with, with the American troop presence being what it is? What is the larger picture in Afghanistan, sir? I think the larger picture for the time being is rather grim. Because uh, the way the Taliban are functioning these days, the way the killings are continuing, and one doesn't even know whether these killings are done by the Taliban or is there a group other than the Taliban which is doing it like people attribute many of these killings to the Islamic State uh, groups, whether they are doing it. So, so there, there is... You know, every day there is a bombing or a killing of, of civilians, more than the killing of the fighters. So the situation on the ground doesn't look very good. And uh, I think at now the stage has come whether the Americans remain or go away. It's not going to make much difference on the ground. If the Afghan defense forces cannot overpower the Taliban or control them, then you know what will happen. And the Pakistan game is obviously that you must have a system which recognizes the Durand line to start with. And what remains then is should be under their control. That is where the problem arises. Both the Durand line is not going to be acceptable to the to the Pakistan. And I don't think Afghanistan would want to be under the tutelage of Pakistan. Absolutely, sir. Uh, so they I don't, they, I think they've bitten more than they can chew eventually. That's how it will be. Absolutely, sir. Thank you very much for joining us, sir. Indeed, a privilege and an honor. You gave your time thank to you, us. Uh, Great talk thank you very you. much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, with uh, Mr. Vikram Sood, former chief of the research and analysis wing, he brought out the basics of intelligence, why human intelligence is extremely important in the 21st century, where you have uh, algorithms, you have artificial intelligence, you have satellites, and you have uh, all sorts of mobile phone and satellite communications. And yet that man on the ground is extremely important. He spoke about 
what Pakistan does, what China does, and what is going to happen in Afghanistan. Next week, I'm going to come back to you with one more episode on the Chanakya Dialogues with one more expert. Till then, stay with us. Jai Hind.